All right, welcome to another episode of Closers or Losers, Jeremy Miner, founder of 7th Level. Now, I am here with a special guest today. Typically, each week, it's it's my business partner and CEO, Matt Ryder, or we bring out a client from a completely different industry, and we talk sales, we talk persuasion, we talk influence. But here and there, because we have so many of you that are salespeople or sales professionals or your sales managers or VPs of sales or chief sales officers, and sometimes you're like, hey, I want to learn how to become an entrepreneur. I want to learn how to run a business. I want to learn mistakes. I want to, you know, that maybe successful entrepreneurs have made in the past and how to avoid them. Or you might be an entrepreneur yourself right now, maybe a solopreneur, maybe you're, uh, you're a CEO of a, a major company. Maybe you're one of our clients and you're wanting to kind of learn some different things from other people outside of your space. So I've got uh, a guest here. He's very popular. He's well known out here, especially in his space. He's the CEO of Gym Launch and Prestige Labs, uh, Prestige Labs, Kale Owen. Now, now, Kale, before you say anything, I'm gonna give you a nice introduction. So, Kale actually started as a client. Now, I love this. Uh, that's how Matt. Uh, my business partner, CEO, started as a client in 2018 when I found at 7th Level. And he started the same way with Alex Hormozzi as a client of Gym Launch. And he brought kind of, I believe you were actually a gym owner, right? And we're going to talk about your story. You're a gym owner. And you came in to like learn how to scale your gyms and, and get them, you know, more profitable, those type of things. And then as a client in January 2022, he then be, I think you started working with Alex before that. And then in 2022, he named you the CEO of both companies. And before launch or before joining Jim Launch, he paid he played four years of collegiate baseball. I love baseball and one years in the Philadelphia Phillies organization. I'm going to ask you about that. And then after he pursued his dream of opening a fitness facility, like I said, he joined Jim Launch in 2017 as a client. And then his spouse, uh, Maggie, I believe is her name, uh, built, built their gym from 31 members. That's awesome to over 250 and less than eight months while working a nine to five sales role for a local web company. We're going to ask, ask you about that. You live in St. Augustine, Florida with your spouse, Maggie, who is also works with you, vice president of operations for gym launch and procedure slaps. And you have two amazing children. Uh, welcome to our podcast. It's a crazy name. Closers or losers. You know, people are like, ah, oh, you know, I'm not a loser. I'm closing. There's a whole different marketing thing around that really catches people attention. So Walk us through here. Um, you became a client of Gym Launch, and you know, I I started following. I didn't even know who it was, but I started seeing ads around 2018. Maybe I think I saw, I started seven seventh level early 2018, and so I started getting on like Facebook and stuff, and I started seeing all these ads from this guy that I don't know if he had a big mustache or a beard then. I can't remember, but one thing that stuck out to me is he was actually one of the only entrepreneurs or business owners that I saw that would show like mountains of testimonials and testimonial after testimonial. I'm like, man, I love this guy because there's so many people out there in your industry and really so many industries that say they get results for clients, but then they have like 10 or 12 testimonials and they use them over and over. And so I really respect an organization that has thousands of clients because that tells me that, hey, what they say they actually can do and that's i think that's something that you, you know in your space i think you found this in really any space there's a lot of people that say they can do something and when you really hire them at least i found starting my company in, in 2018 90 percent of them really could not do half of what they said they could do so when i find a company that can actually follow through and get results for their clients i have like mad respect so tell us a little bit about that when you became a client of gym launch and, and kind of that whole story i think everybody wants to know yeah for sure jeremy first of all thank you for having me on really appreciate this um been following you for a long time really appreciate what you're honored yeah absolutely uh long time listener first time caller so Really appreciate uh, the time. So yeah, so I joined, I had a struggling gym. I was eight weeks from shutting my doors and we had 31 clients at the time. And I think it was 31 to 33. I can't remember. Um, I believe it was 31. And I had actually gone online for six months before, like online fitness. And I was using someone from Australia, great guy, awesome program. I was actually making more money online than it was for my gym, but I still had three years left in my lease. And so I'm going through this process and I'm like, okay, something's not right. Something's got to change. 
And a month before I joined Gym Launch, I actually went and got a job at a local web design agency because okay. I was tired of not making money. My gym was making four thousand dollars a month in revenue. My rent was three thousand. So you guys can do the math on how so it was more like it was more like fun, like seeing everybody work out, get bucks, was... but you weren't really making any profit. <laughs> which is not fun. Which is not fun um, at all because it was three years into two years into the business, a little over two years into the business. And it's not fun. I wanted to make money. I wanted to take care of my family. I had a two-year-old at the time with another one soon to be on the way. And I was just like, no, nah, I'm tired of it. living out of a one bedroom studio. Um, yeah, not fun. Um, no money whatsoever. I remember 2016 tax returns combined. My wife and I made $29,000. Uh, yeah. You know, the dream of being an entrepreneur yeah. was not so like awesome in the beginning. No, no. The beginning. no it was terrible. So Ended up uh, actually learning about Alex through this online group that I was with. He brought him in to talk about sales. And I was like, this guy knows what he's talking about. And he was talking about brick and mortar stuff. And I was like, well, I own a brick and mortar gym. So I did my research, research, and I started looking up Alex. And I started looking at his testimonials. At the time, he had what I thought was overwhelming proof that it worked. And he had a yeah. roughly 33 testimonials. To today, oh, no. it's okay. today, we have 1,500. Uh, well, technically right. over 1,500. We're closer to like 1,800 different testimonials we can grab and it's growing every day. And that's on actual screenshots of revenue. We have tons of testimonials on like weekly, daily, monthly, all that stuff. But I'm talking like full growth of start to finish. Here to here. Like yeah. Here. Our, yeah. We are like testimonials. Yeah. We call. We've got real testimonials. So like, oh, Alex has a cool beard or Kale, I really like his shirts. Like those are real or, testimonials. Yeah, or like I made eight thousand dollars today in sales, right? So like we have those. That's what not what I count because that's a flash in the pan. I think you're the same sure. way. You want to see start to finish, and so we have tens of thousands of the simple ones. But we at the time, and I was I went to my wife, and I had already invested money in this online program, and this was a last ditch effort on my side. And I was like, hey, we got eight weeks. Let's give it our best shot. Let's grow it, and then if we have something valuable, then we can sell it, and then we can move on. And joined it. 10 days later, I made as much money in 10 days as I had in the previous full, like nine months in my gym. What would you, I mean, I know you're the CEO of the company now, but looking back, like being in like the client shoes at yeah. that point, what do you think, what was the biggest thing that Jim Launch and Alex and everybody there, like skill level gave you to be able to do that that quick? I mean, a lot of people are like, wow, that's instant ROI. Like what, what changed in 10 days? Well, it's funny. I'm actually doing a VSL right now on this. Um, so there's three levels of gyms, right? There's the gym owners that are making less than $20,000. There's the gym owners that are making twenty dollars to $50,000 a month. And then there's the gym owners that are making fifty dollars to $85,000 a month. If you're under $20,000 a month, you have one primary problem, and that is you don't have an acquisition system. You cannot acquire yeah. clients profitably and consistently. You'll get leads every now and then. You may get some referrals. You probably don't run ads or you dabble in ads, or maybe you've tried in the past. It doesn't work. You're just getting people to walk in the door that might it's, see your, you might be a CrossFit gym. Yeah. I see. And they're like, oh, I do CrossFit gym. I close to my house. I'll walk in. That's okay. the build it, they will come mentality, which we all know doesn't work, right? And then yeah. if you're between 20 and 50, you probably have okay acquisition, but you haven't mastered it, right? You've gotten okay. to a point where maybe you've dabbled in some stuff and you can grow a little bit, but the problem is the next thing happens, which is churn. And so you haven't tackled churn. So now you got bodies coming in and bodies going out because you haven't yeah. systematized anything, right? So you have no systems. There's nothing moving, able to be able to really just create a process around your clients onboarding yeah. and the long get them in, keep them in yeah. and then be a, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And go. And then when you're in the 50 to 85 K acquisitions, pretty much on the lock, you're pretty good. You've, if you've gotten to that point, you know how to acquire clients at okay. this point, if you want to get over a hundred thousand dollars a month, which is what we do at gym launch for gyms consistently over a hundred thousand dollars a month, then the next step is three really primary things. One of them is still churn because as you grow churn is something, no matter what you got to always make sure that you're working on it, increasing the client's yeah. clients, make it better. The other two yeah. things are things that most owners don't talk about. That is expansion revenue, meaning how can I make my clients more valuable to me so that how can I make more money off of them while improving their experience and their results without acquiring new clients? So how can I take a client that's worth maybe an LTV of 2,500 currently to 5,000? Okay. And how can I like double their like LTV? Amps or like other things outside classes, yeah. Semi, okay. semi-private uh, semi -private programs. So go from large group to semi-private or semi-private to private, or you do specific six-week programs internally, you do internal programs, all that stuff. Supplement, I mean, apparel. There's all these different wallets with spending wallets that we talk about. How can we dip into those and capture that revenue? Then the next one is just teams. This is when leaders really like leaders step up or they burn down. 
because okay. at this point, if you want to get over a hundred thousand dollars a month, you can't do it all. So you got to build it. A management team, leadership team, okay, yeah. all this. And you have to be able to have a vision and you have to be able to communicate that vision clearly. And then you have to be able to hold the team accountable. So you have to be able to find, like attract, you have to be able to hire, you have to be able to onboard and retain top talent. And yeah. if you can do that, then you can easily scale over 100K. And what we do is we help gyms at every step of those because we have systems at every step of those to get over 100K. So we just help you yeah. to do it for once and this level. Here's what you do now. Okay, that makes, that makes sense. But I want to talk about uh, your baseball career. Yeah. I love baseball. I play low college baseball too. So I, I, love, I love my baseball guys. Okay. How has baseball or just sports in general in your mind, like help you run a business? Like, are there some things, some habits or like, tell, tell us a little bit about your experience there. I think, so my experience personally was I was always the underdog. So, um, when I played professional baseball, I was five foot nine, 150 pounds. So yeah, tiny. I was always the smallest kid on my team. I was always the weakest kid on my team, all teams growing up. So like I had to work my absolute butt off. And you great shortstop, right? Yes. Yep. Can shortstop. You Everybody makes it at that. They're over on Senga base. You, you know, they're like yeah. the Senga base, you know, the yeah. small, you know, yeah. Okay, yeah. So yeah. it was, and it was one of those where I learned quickly that I had to grind it out and I had to outwork every single person in yeah. everywhere. So like, I was like, I, how can I be, what can I do? What's in my control? And in my control, I wasn't given the God given genetic ability that other individuals were. So instead of sulking about it and then stopping I decided, yeah. cool, I'll just outwork them and I'll do my best that I possibly can. And when you say outwork them, are you talking about like you were focusing on like your skill level, like yeah. your tech, when you were hitting your technique, you know, to to get the ball out of your glove quicker to to first base because you have maybe a shorter reach, right? Because you're yep. a little bit shorter than like Alex Rodriguez is like 6'4", or something swinging it over there. Yep. Tell us a little bit about why why your skill level, because I always talk about, you know, sales salespeople have always been, taught that, hey, selling is a numbers game, you know, you know, j j call as many people, get as many no's as you can to get that yes. But the problem is when, when sales leaders teach their salespeople that salespeople start focusing on more of the quantity instead of the quality of each conversation. And so what we really teach is sales is more of a skills game, right? Than a numbers game. And we're focused on our skill level to close a higher percentage of the prospects we actually talk to. It's like, you know, if you uh, basketball, Steph Curry, you know, if he said, oh, basketball is a numbers game, just shoot as many threes as you can, you know, and you'll eventually hit one, he would have never made it on his varsity basketball team in high school. So he focused on his technique. He knows it's a skills game. So did you focus on your skill, like skill level? Like how has that focusing on your skill level really helped you in the business world? Yeah, right. They talk about practice makes perfect, which is totally wrong, right? Intentionally focused pra practice over a reasonable amount of time makes perfect, right? And the right Right? It's like Michael and Jordan says, take a thousand jump shots a day, but if your technique is off, you're still going to suck at basketball, right? You have to have to practice work on the right technique. Yeah, I love that. Keep and in baseball, so for example, by from the age of 13 to 23, I hit 100 balls off a tee every single day. And by tee, so I had a full routine. So I'd hit 10 the other way. I'd hit 10 up the middle. I'd hit 10 pull. I'd move the tee up. So I'd hit high balls, low balls. I'd hit pitches right inside and work and get my hands inside. Then I would hit front toss. BP. Yeah. If there was someone to throw BP in front toss, great. If not, I was hitting off the tee. Then I would take 100 ground balls every single day. And so, and I would long toss every single day. And so for me, it was just, how can I work on ground balls up the middle, ground balls in the hole, backhands, um, ground balls short, like um, slow rollers. How can I come in, make a throw on the run, right? All these different things, my footwork around the back, turning a double play. It's me, a tight and sheets. Yo, yes. Yeah. What is this? If I step here, what is the difference in timing if I step here compared to here? Right. When I go to turn a double play, sometimes I play second. It's like, okay, I need to get my foot around the ball first rather than just fielding it square on and having to turn all the way and throw it to second base, oh, turn double play. Yeah. Yeah. That's a difference yeah. between your focus on your technique and skill level, right? Whereas a lot of people would probably do the same thing. They might, I'm gonna take a hundred grounders a day, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit a hundred balls a day, but they weren't focused on the intentional thing. Like, or, oh, I'm gonna take thirty like right here in the middle because I've got to I better be able to move my hands quick. Or, Compared to just I've hitting the hunters. I've got a perfect story for this. So the winter before I went into my last season, my spring training where I actually got cut on the very last day, I spent the entire off season with Miguel Cairo. Miguel Cairo was a long-term 
MLB player, travel uh, like he traveled a lot to different teams, but he was an exceptional baseball player across the board. Played for the Rays, Yankees, Cardinals, you name it. He's so I started playing, I started practicing with him and I had the opportunity to do that, which is amazing. He made me for the first two weeks of the offseason get on my knees and he just rolled ground balls to me barehanded for the first yeah. two weeks. Because he's like, yeah. no, your hands are too stiff, so we're just going to work on it. Then next week, I couldn't move. I had to stand up, get in a fielding position, and he'd hit ground balls at me barehanded. Then the next week, I still couldn't wear a glove. So the first four weeks of offseason, I haven't touched a glove yet. So like, I'm literally fielding ground balls barehanded, and he is just hammering balls at me on astral turf, and I can only move my feet and field it because he's like, I need to retrain the way your hands work. And so from there, I mean, we spent hours and hours and hours, but it's that skill level and this, this specific intentional practice is what carries over. And so we try to, whereas, as we try to, yeah, that's so true because whereas other people were, were, you know, hitting a hundred ground balls to them, you're like intentional on like what you're trying to prove on, which each of those hits, whereas they were just randomly doing that, which sets your skill level above anybody else's. That's incredible. And the difference was like, we didn't talk about how many ground balls we had. We had a big five gallon bucket of balls. Like we were fortunate enough to be at a baseball academy where we could do this. So we had a big five gallon bucket of balls and yeah. we just didn't stop. So we did it for hours. Yeah. So it was both yeah. intentional focused practice with volume. And when you combine those, that's when transformation so, and I've, and I've heard you say that before, and I've also heard, you know, because I, I follow you and Alex Hormozzi on, I believe it's IG, so I, you know, I hear some reels from you guys do. And I've heard Alex talk about that. How is that translated into running your business? So when we're trying to fix something, right, or we have a problem inside of the business, the first step is we do a full audit on like what's happening, right? Or we'll bring in a team to do an audit, right? Um, to figure out what are we missing? What's, what, what is something? I think, I think what you brought us in to do a sales yeah. audit recently, yeah. Matt, Matt and our chief sales officer. Okay, that makes it. To kind of break down. Because sometimes like we can't see the forest through the trees, right? Even though- yeah, but you, you don't know what you don't know what you don't. Yeah. And maybe it's, it's good validation for what we already knew. So, which is fine. I'm, I would love to pay for that, right? Because I want to make sure that we're on the right path. And yeah. once we get in, then it's a matter of great. We figure out what we need to do. And then we attack that one to two things and we do it intentionally and at volume. So if we yeah. want to test something or we want to fix something, we're going to focus solely on that. And we're going to fix that. We're going to get that right. And not just get it right. We're going to make sure that it stays right. And then we're going to move on to the next thing. Next thing. And I think that's so true because, you know, like my, my CEO, my business partner, Matt, he always talks about this, like a lot, most companies. Uh, especially smaller companies when they're starting out, you know, maybe they're doing a couple million dollars a month or whatever, something will go wrong and they think it's this. So they yeah. just go in and change it, but they don't really know. And they just go change something and it quite literally might not even be that at all. And they change that and then it gets even worse. And now they're like, shit, I don't know what to do. And so it's like, it's like you, you really have to like really understand what the problem is and not just guess. You have to have like hard data. You have to have audits. We do the same thing. Like if something's wrong, we'll bring outside companies to audit us. And like you're the saying the same thing. It's like we might find that we're doing everything perfect there, but then they find something that we didn't even know about. This is where we're messing up. And we're like, damn, we're glad we didn't fix. Think this was broke. We thought this was broke. And if we had tried to fix that and it was really working, it just makes it. And I see so many companies do that and they just, they go south because they just don't know what's wrong and they just start fixing everything that could be working well. And then it just gets, I think there's a, I'd love to hear that you guys do the same thing. I think there's a aspect and I, I love this about you, Jeremy and your team. A lot of business owners tend to have this ego around, we'll figure it out. We'll do it ourselves. We'll bootstrap it. And like yeah. the winners just want to win and it doesn't matter who is right. It's what is yeah. right. And so like, you'll go out and bring someone else in and figure out, okay, cool. This is the right way to do it. Like, I'll do the same thing. I don't care if I'm the right one or the wrong one. I want to know, I want to win. Win. It's so true. It's, it's the ego. It, it's totally on the ego. You know, there's, there's one business owner. I'm not going to name the names because I have a, a lot of respect for this, uh, for this gentleman and company, but he brought us in to basically replace his sales te team that had been just sucking for several years. So we brought in part of our done for you side of the business. We brought in like three or four guys, not a huge company or anything. And we tripled the revenue quite literally almost four X it in 90 days. And he got on some sales calls and he was like, hey, I don't like the way your guys are selling. I don't like the way they're explaining the product in the presentation. Like, I'm, I'm just gonna, I don't like this. Like, let's just end the deal. And we're sitting here looking at this guy's numbers. And we're sitting here like, you went quite literally from about 200 grand in new revenue per month 
to now almost 800 grand new revenue a month. New revenue in 90 days. We almost forexed your revenue and you're telling us you want to end the deal because you don't like the way our team who just started working with you is explaining your product in the presentation. I'm like, all that, I'm just sitting like, okay, let's just end it. You know, Matt's like, let's just end it because I'm like, that's just ego. Like, if, if my company gets four times bigger, I could care less how it happened. As long as it's like ethical and, and you know, and not going to get us in trouble where we can scale long term. If somebody helps me forex the business, I could care less who, who it was or what happened because it's just the ego. Yeah. And it's a it's something that I see a lot. I mean, I had it when I got on the call with Layla Hermosi back in the day to join Gym Launch. She was like, tell me about your gym. And I said the same spiel that every gym owner tells our team. We're different. We run a different program. Our community is amazing. We don't have churn. I don't have a problem closing people. And what I need is just a, a way to get more leads. That's what every gym owner literally says. Like minus a couple where they're like, yeah, I just want to increase my profit, which I love those gym owners because they get it. But then then they, then it's like, I have 31 members. Like my community is only good because I can text all of them and I know all their names. What happens when I have 150, right? And it's like, I don't have a sales, I don't, I do have a sales problem, but I also have a lead problem. I have a lead nurture problem. I have a sales process problem. I have an onboarding problem. Like I've got so many other issues that won't become apparent until we blow the doors off of your acquisition. And that is when the next problem arises. Problem arises. It's so true. I, you know, it, it's, it's like, it's like companies in that position, like they have such high egos that they're trying to protect themselves that it ultimately destroys them and takes them. It puts in most of those companies out of business. If you're just more vulnerable and like real, like I always like, I'm always like, well, what is real? Like not what I think is real, but like, what does the data actually show? Do we have this problem? Well, like, you know, a couple of years ago, so we're four years old now to the beginning of, or into 2017. So about four, four and a half, almost five, shit, five years, time's flying. But after a couple of years, when it was me and my assistant and like one salesperson, I'm like, all right, me as the CEO, I'm never going to be able to scale this. It doesn't matter how great the training is, how many testimonies we'll have. Like, I've got to bring somebody in that can actually run a business and know what they're doing and actually scale it, right? I've got to let my ego down and realize like, hey, I'm not cut out to run a business. Like I used to be a chief sales officer for Fortune 500 company and all that stuff. That's completely different than actually owning, running the business, putting your own money in. And I don't have the skill level to do that. I need to focus on my strengths and what I excel at and bring somebody in that has the other strengths to really scale. And that's where I brought in Matt. And then everything changed, right? We 10, 10 X or whatever. And it's the same true, you know, we marketing, we're like, okay, we've got all these marketing agencies out there. We're throwing all this money out there. We think they're good at marketing, but here's where we're at. We've got to make some changes. And then that's when we, you know, brought in some internal stuff and started working that out. And then we scaled even more. So the biggest lesson I learned as a business owner is like, man, your ego can crush you. You just got to let that go and, and really know where you're at. Cause once you're honest with yourself, then you know what to fix. And if you're never honest with yourself, you have this this big head on your shoulders and you just suck. Yeah, it's a, it's a gut check for me constantly. I try to make sure always that I'm checking my ego, no matter what, no matter yeah. what. I think ego is what kills most businesses, especially like, you know, I don't, would, would Gym Launch consider themselves like in the high ticket space? Is that what you kind of consider yourself coaching high tickets? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely, we're a consulting, consulting firm. I would say is like a licensing and consulting firm. And we're definitely high ticket. We're the highest, one of the most expensive, if not the most expensive gym consulting firm, firm yeah. out there. Well, you get results, right? That's, yeah, but that's what I would say. People, prospects are always willing to pay more to the company where they feel can get them the best result. Quite literally, right? You're always going to pay more for the company. If you're, if you're hiring a marketing agency and you're like, man, they are crushing for all these different clients. They're 30% more than anybody else, but damn, I want to scale my company. You're always going to pay more to the company or individuals who, who you feel understands your unique situ the situation the most and can get you the best result, period. It doesn't matter how much you charge. All right. I want to talk about besides ego as a huge problem that most entrepreneurs have. I, that's one of the biggest problems. What's maybe a few other mistakes that that maybe you've noticed like in your own business that you've made that you know here's what i did and i didn't realize it but here's how we fix it so maybe a few mistakes that you notice a lot of entrepreneurs make it could be in your space or any space and then you know how did you how did you overcome those 
those mistakes. Yeah, I think the number one, this is really a boring one, but it's one that I think plagues the majority. Boring is good, man. Yep, I love boring. Um, we One of our core tenants is do the boring work. So it's tracking data, but not just tracking data, it's tracking the right metrics, the metrics that matter inside mm-hmm. of a business and, and really being willing to go granular on the things that truly matter to figure out what is the data telling us? What's the story? What are the trends? Like what needs to fix? How can we improve this? Can we improve it? Um, is this going in the direction that we want? Data has always been something for us. Like we started out of Google Sheets, like this bit was started in Google Sheets and we still have stuff in Google Sheets. And um, if you talk to Matt, like our data before, we had great data before and then somehow uh, which lead into my next issue that I struggle with and I think a lot of people struggle with, but we that got messed up and then we had to rebuild data again and tracking and all this stuff. That's just on the sales side. And I think it, a lot of, if you if you have accurate data, you can make great decisions and you can make great decisions faster. And if you can make great decisions faster, you will win in the marketplace long-term. It's reasonable to believe if you have the right information in front of you to a degree, because by the time you have perfect, all the perfect information is too late. But when you have great data in front of you, you can make great decisions more often than not. Um, so oh, true. yeah. And then the other thing, which is the problem that we had before, I think, I think a lot of times leaders, and this is something maybe I just struggle with. Um, and that is making assumptions that people on your team are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be, uh, true. Especially when you're virtual, cause you, you're not necessarily yeah. there watching them at their desk do stuff. Right. So yeah. kind of when COVID happened and a lot of companies went virtual, I think that sometimes, you know, you just assume they're doing stuff and they might not be doing what you think they're doing. Yeah. And there's, there's two, two sides, two parts of that, right? So like one is the training aspect and the onboarding. So making sure that they're set up for success and then they continue training moving forward. But then the second piece, which is as someone becomes a leader in the company, especially if they've been there before, there's this assumption that they already know what needs to happen at each level because they've been part of the organization. And we think as leaders that they've heard us talking about these things enough to where it becomes second nature for them. Yeah. And we don't have to restate it. And we also don't have to have this, this verification process consistently to make sure it's happening. It's not micromanaging. It's, it's verifying that things are happening to the standards that are set. And that's one of my biggest issues that um, consistently rears its ugly head that I need to just stop being a stupid person and just learn from it and adjust like, and never go back. I, I think having the right data is so true because I, I'm one of those type of people I was like, let's just grow, you know, you know, like I want to, I want to get to $10 million a month, no matter what, like let's just put, you know, gas to, you know, just freaking like step on the gas, spend whatever money we need to do to get to $10 million a month. Whereas I have my business partner, my CEO of Matt, who's more like realistic it, you know, then I've, I've also got our CRO. He's a business partner as well here, Marco Bertiz. I don't know if you've he's awesome. Though. He's awesome. Uh, he's, he's like, he's like the wizard. He's, I always call him like my Elon Musk. He's like Elon Musk, Einstein with marketing and stuff. And I'm like, Marco, like, I want to really scale our IG. You know, we've got you know, close to 500,000 people on there. We started about a year and a half ago and it's really, it's really grown. And I'm like, I want to hire a company that where we can do more shout outs. And instead of getting like 30,000, you know, new followers a month, I want to get a hundred thousand followers a month. And we start doing that. And we did that for like a month or so where we spent like triple the amount on that stuff, but our revenue went down and it's, and we started looking at the data and we're like, okay, we're getting all these followers, but our social media team, because we can only have a certain amount in the DMS at a time they can't reach 90% of those. So we're literally spending this money and we can't make money off this, these extra followers. So it might look cool that you have a bunch of followers, but when you're not making any money off of it and you're spending money to attain those, it doesn't make sense. So we had to follow the data to see what the sweet spot is. And that's where we stay. And we stay in that sweet spot and we're profitable from that. But it's just, you know, it's me like, I don't want to go off data. I just want to have a bunch of followers. Whereas my business partner's like, no, we're going to go off the data and what's profitable and what actually scales us. So I think, you know, when you have a business, you have to have, you know, maybe you have somebody like me that's just like the visionary guy that just wants to throw all this out there, but you're going to have people that can actually run the company, you know, main yes. profit. Absolutely. <laughs> they have to be, they have to be willing to do the work and they have to do it exceptionally well. Like at my level, my problems, what I do with my time is primarily thinking, planning ahead for the future, working on our startup, and then really diving into holes in the business. Um, Cause I can't do it all. Like there's so many roles now that I can't do when before I could have done them, but now like, I can't do it. I can't do that. You just don't have time. You have to have people that you can trust. And I think that when you're building a business, you know, if you're listening to me and Kayla and you're, you're like, Hey, I want to start a business over everything. It's like the thing that I figured out very early on is that you, you have to have people on your team 
that are exceptional at things that you suck at, right? Like yeah. you really have to have good people. Like if I'm not the best person at operations, like running a business, right? But I have Matt, our CEO, and we have operations people that excel in that, right? And so whatever your weaknesses are, you typically want to have a business partner that's really strong in those areas and a management team that's strong in those areas. And that's really what caused you to scale. Doesn't matter how great your product or service is, if you don't have people that can really run the business and get it out there, you're really going nowhere. Yeah. Do you mind if I throw in something real quick that I learned from all, but also I'm learning now is that for anyone that's listening to this and you're at that growth stage, maybe you have a management team, but maybe you're still in one department. Maybe you're really good at marketing. I'll use that as an example. You're the best at marketing, but you've hired around you. You're always going to be the bottleneck. Yeah. You will always be the bottleneck. And your, your business will only grow to your level. And by this point, if you have a management team around and you're still running marketing, it won't grow past where you probably are, maybe a little bit. Because you have to be able to duplicate yourself to give yourself the opportunity to grow and become the visionary or the leader that your business needs. And if you can't do that, that's fine. Then your business will most likely stay where it is. But I mean, this we had this in gym launch for a while because Alex being the powerhouse that he is in marketing, it was very hard to duplicate himself because he could come in if things weren't going great shoot some ads. We run ads like 2018, 2019, we run them and then we get a pop, right? And so like, or he'd jump in the community and he'd make a post and then we'd have a bunch of upsells. And we had to make that transition starting in 2020 of removing him from ads and advertisements. That took a year and a half. So that took a year and a half. Yeah, because you started focusing on, you started branding like gym launch and the methodology rather than the individual because that's the biggest difference there is because so many businesses, they're, branded around the guru so the guru can never leave but i you know i i even i've been in some you know some private masterminds with some some even bigger companies than, than maybe you and and what we have here at seven level we're both growing and they're just folk they're just branded around the guru and i and i ask like well what happens when you're 75 like where is your business then like, i don't really know and i'm just like okay i don't want to be in that situation i want to have a business that's here and 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. I, I think you're right. You have to brand around the methodology and the company. Correct. And it takes longer. Usually I'm the person that like, it won't take as long as you think if you apply volume and you applied speed and intentional focus. But in this case, because there's things you can't control, meaning the public's perception of your brand, it will take longer than you think. I mean, it took a good 18 months and we still have clients that come in that came to us from Alex because they recognize Alex and they're a gym owner and they're like, oh, gym launch, I'm going to come to the business, but that's dwindling every day, right? And that just takes time. And Alex has been out of ads for now two years, but like it, it takes time. But there's also very few businesses that have an Alex Hermosi as the founder who then sold it and then started a bigger brand than a business. That's, that rarely happens. So that's, that rarely happens. Yeah, that's that's valid. Uh, you know, some some people, we, we pulled our audience and stuff and they had some different questions they want to ask you. What was it like to work with Alex? That was a question that like hundreds of people asked. It was an opportunity of a lifetime. It was a whirlwind. I, had, I learned more in the, he's one of my closest friends. I will say that um, I would do anything for him. Um, yeah. I, he stood by me, gave me a chance, um, taught me, and it was over the course of four years of really, really two years of being like right next to him, like 2020 to when we sold and moving forward, I was right next to him. So like right. it was two years of like, I'd fly to his house, we'd shoot ads. He taught me how to do all this stuff. And we spent so much time every week, um, talking and you know, you, I learned more in that two years of business strategy making offers, leads, growing a business and influencing people than I had in my entire life. Influencing people than I had in my entire life. What was the biggest thing you learned from as far as running the business? Man, there's so many. Man, there's so many. <laughs> Something. Um, you can always do things faster than you think. Do things faster than you think. Always. Yeah. Most people tend to, um, tend to expand, right? It's Parkinson's, what is it? Parkinson's law. Like we'll expand um, our work to fit the amount of time allotted. Yeah. For most people, if you needed to go out and you need to get a um, hundred leads, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. cool. Most people would be like, great, I'm going to run some ads. I'll take a week to get them set and I'll do them. Well, okay. What if you just grabbed your phone and you DM to a hundred people right now? And then you grabbed your phone and you texted a hundred people inside of your phone. And then you went on to Facebook and DM'd a hundred people on Facebook. And then what if you also decided to just spend five hours tonight going through a Facebook ads course, and then you launch your ads. Like what if, 
Like, what if you just did that? So instead of taking two weeks to get your ad slide, you just got it done in 24 hours. Right. Right. So, you, so basically you're, you know, you're willing to do things that other entrepreneurs are just not willing to do. Yeah. It's that's where, and the pure volume. I mean, he's such a workhorse. There's another lesson that I think I got. There's two things. He's a mass, he's a workhorse and he goes, he goes deep. He doesn't just go, he doesn't go wide on like a whole bunch of different subjects, even though he's very well versed in so many things. Cause he's, yeah. he's gen, like genuinely, he's, he's way smarter than people actually know. Like way smarter. Um, I mean, he graduated in three years from Vanderbilt. Um, he was like, he, he knows his stuff and in all aspects of education, but he goes deeper on a subject or a problem more than anyone I've ever met. And when I talk about deeper, I'm talking to the minute details. If you've got a problem or trying to dissect things, this is what I learned from him is he just kept asking question after question after question to the point of like, for example, in a sales process. Okay. Well, what do you say there? Okay. What's your yeah. tonality there? Why did you say it that way? Okay, why didn't you say this? Have you tested that before? Well, yeah. what happened when you said that? What was the percentage change when you said that? Okay, but yeah. then you said this next. Why'd you say that? Yeah. Like, I mean, that. Yeah. Like, I mean, well, it's, under it's understanding, understanding what's behind it, right? Where else yeah. most salespeople or entrepreneurs, they're surface level. So basically what you're saying is he's just, he's going below the surface. Like really. He wants to understand the first principles. Wants to understand the first principles. Yeah, I understand. It's understanding the 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 why behind it. That's the that's yeah. what most people don't understand. It's not just why somebody wants to change or why somebody wants to start with gym launch, but it's what's behind that. What's driving the why? See, most salespeople and entrepreneurs, I think they look for the why, but I think the very best look for what's behind that why. Like what's driving the why? You know, it's just taking it a, a much a deeper there. Uh, so a lot of people are asking something that he does that's really weird. <laughs> I don't know why that would, that question came up like 50 times. What's something that when you're around him, he did, you're like, man, that's just really weird. I know I do weird stuff. Like Matt's like, dude, that's really weird. But it's just, you know, it's just. Man, I've gotten so used to being around him. Um, here's something, it's not really weird, but it's really funny though. If he wants to get a hold of you, he's not gonna stop. It doesn't matter the time. So like he'll text you. So like he'll shoot me a text. And then if he wants to get a hold of me, he'll text me nonstop and call me nonstop until I pick up. Call me nonstop until I pick up. <laughs> but I like, okay, that, which is great. Like, but like, if so he just, he's just, he's just, he's like, I'm going to, he's a man of singular focus. If he needs to get something done, he will get it done. And he doesn't, it doesn't matter. He will get it done. And he'll reach out to other people. Like if, if I wasn't available and he was trying to reach out to me for some reason, he'd reach out to Maggie. Then he'd be like, Hey, I need to talk to Caleb. Sure. Yeah, and he's, like, hey, he's gonna reach out somebody to get you or something. Yeah. All right, so he's fanatical. Of like, I mean, he wants to get something done. He's just gonna drive till he gets it done. That's not, you know, that's a. Some people might think that that's weird, but you know, maybe it's weird, but it's it successful, successful. Weirdness sometimes is successful. Pointed in the right direction because he's, like I said, a man of singular focus when he puts his mind to something and he wants to do it. Like he will just go to the ends of the earth to figure it out and make it happen. Yeah, you know, in the gap. Uh, okay, so a couple other things. What what is your best book you've ever read to like really run a business? I mean, or maybe a couple, like what's really a couple, like one or two like books where you're just like, man, there's some great books out there, but this one or two really stand out and here's why it's, why it's helped me. But The Motive by Patrick Lencioni. The Motive. Okay. The Motive. Yep. It's my favorite book on, um, it's a kind of a story and lessons all in one. And it's talking about how to be an exceptional CEO. And the whole idea behind it is actually becoming a CRO, which is a chief reminding officer and reminding, not in the way of just always hounding people, but more so reminding people of the vision and your values and consistently holding your team accountable to the standards that are set and helping support them so that they are able to uh, achieve the mission of the business and right. really, truly inspiring the people around you and, yes. um, not being this tyrannical CEO that expects everything to happen exactly how he wants it, but being willing to build an exceptional team, lean on the team and be there to support them. And be there to support them. Get them to catch your vision where you want to with the company. That's what we, you know, that's what we found at, at seventh level is like, if you, if you have like a specific mission, not just like, Hey, we're out here to make sales and you know if you're a salesperson for us to work we're out here to make you more money and we're out here to like grow the business 
that's just basic stuff. But like, what's the mission? Like, why are you even in business? Like, what what are you doing out there? Like, what what are you trying to solve in the market, and why? Like, what's behind the mission, right? So I think once you get that, and and you communicate that with your team, your team can buy into that mission. Obviously, they want to be financially compensated well and have a good work experience. But if you can't get them to like come to work each day and focus on that vision, I think you have a higher attrition. At least we've seen that. Yeah. Absolutely. What about a great podcast that you really like to to watch or listen to? That's um, I don't know if this has maybe helped me run the business. I actually stopped listening to a whole bunch of stuff, and I tend to read more books. I tend to listen to uh, the only podcast I actually listen to is the All In Podcast. Okay. Two is the All In Podcast. Um, so the all in podcast is for high level business operators and VC capitalists. Um, and they venture capitalists and they basically just sit down They're four friends and they go at it about current events, uh, the debt markets, the financial markets, what's happening in business. They talk about tech and all this stuff. Um, and I highly suggest it to anyone in business because it's a really good insight into really bright minds and they're all friends with differing views. They go at it, but they still stay friends. And I think it's really good. It's a great point of view. And it's something very common that I see in high level people hanging around Alex and other high level people that are around him. It's a very common thing that I see that they are willing to, they love hanging around people with differing views and it's not a problem for them because it gives them an opportunity to expand and learn. And yeah. it's really cool. I, I get a lot from that. Um, so might have just, um, I'm gonna have to tell you the all in. Yep, the all in podcast. Yeah, all we're on podcasts. But take a look at that. I think that's so true. Like, you know, I typically, I, I like to hang out with people that make way more money than me. Yeah. Right? And usually I hang out with people that are like 20 or 30 years older. I, 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 you know, here in Scottsdale, I've got a few friends that are my age that are pretty successful that I hang out with. But I like to hang out with people that are like their 60s, their 70s. Sometimes, you know, like one of my best friends is like a huge builder back in the Midwest. He's like almost 80 years old, but I love hanging out with that guy, having dinner with him every couple of weeks because he teaches me things and completely in a different industry. I like construction building industry, I have no idea, but he just comes from a different point of view and a different perspective that's given me different thoughts of, of what to do in my own business, even though it's something completely different. So, you know, the old saying is you are who you associate yourself with. So true. Uh, sometimes you just have to hang out with a different crowd that maybe you wouldn't normally hang out with, you're not talking baseball or sports, but you're talking business or whatever. Tell us about the future of Gym Launch and Pre uh, Prestige Labs. Like, wh where where are you guys going? Like new heights in the, the market? What's the future? Where are you guys? Yeah, so our mission at Gym Launch is to help and Gains. So Gains is the holding company that we have. We have three. We have a startup I'll talk about in a second. But our, our mission is to help gym owners around the world reach more people, change more lives, and build wildly profitable businesses. Yeah. And the gym launch side, our goal is to grow and continue to serve clients and consistently grow um, to various different offerings. Right now, we, we primarily have just one, and I want to expand our product offering um, to reach a lot of gym owners, um, both with a lower ticket and we have our higher ticket. So we want to do that. We want to expand our, our market segmentation there. And then okay. on the Prestige Lab side, continue to build out our product line to offer more products. Um, they're incredibly high quality. They were designed by... Um, the youngest biochemist to get his PhD um, in America. Um, super smart, uh, really incredible um, biochemist. And we want to continue to evolve our product line and continue to provide an exceptional service to our clients. And it's an affiliate driven supplement um, line. And we sell through primarily through our gym owners, our brick and mortar facilities. And we want to also, we give back to them. So we've actually given out over $19 million in commissions in 2018 to just regular gym owners around the world. So, and I say around the world, it's pretty, pretty much us and Canada work, working on expanding. So that's another aspect is expanding, being expanding. So yeah. Another aspect. Just being an affiliate. Uh, all right. Yeah. So, so where, where can they, what you guys do is, is there, is there like a book or can they follow you somewhere? Like, where can they learn more about what you guys do? Yeah. We're actually in the process of sending this book to every gym owner in the United States, uh, for free gym launch secrets. Um, so you can go there, but go to gymlaunch.com. You can find out more about Gym Launch. You go to prestigelabs.com to learn more about Prestige Labs. If you're a gym owner and you want to become an affiliate of Prestige Labs, you can do it for free. We'll teach you how to sell supplements for free. We'll do all that stuff for free. And then um, if you want to learn more about me or follow me, you can follow me on Instagram at Kale Owen, um, on TikTok at Kale Owen. And you can follow all the Gym Launch. And all we're saying with the B, right? Yep. C. Yep. Like the leafy, like the leafy green, just spelling right. the sleep. And then we have one new brand I got to mention though is gymowners.com. So we're building a tech startup, which will be a brand new CRM for the entire industry that they've never seen before with task automation, better reporting, 
where we will actually eliminate a job inside of uh, a gym, including an admin position and do the work for the gym owners to help them be able to close more deals, but more importantly, maintain their memberships and keep their members longer and keep their members longer. Yeah. Okay. I like that. All right, everybody, make sure you guys follow Kale on uh, TikTok and Instagram. Get that book. All right. You're going to learn a lot. Even if you're, you know, a lot of you, probably some of you gym owners on here, but a lot of you probably aren't, but I guarantee you like reading that book, you're going to learn more stuff about entrepreneurship, sales. You know, I know uh, Alex does some reels on sales and stuff like that as well. So, you know, make sure you follow these guys. Uh, Kayla, it's been an honor to have you uh, on here. Been looking forward to it. I, I heard about a month ago that we we're going to have you here on the podcast. Any last words of advice from our, you know, maybe some of our salespeople that listen to the show or like sales managers or leaders that maybe are looking to, you know, lead their teams better or maybe become an entrepreneur? Yeah, do the boring work every day. Wake up, skill acquisition, do the boring work and go to Alex Hermosi's lead, his $100 million leads book call that he's releasing. It's a phenomenal book. I've already had a chance to read it. You guys are going to love it. I got to plug that because obviously he's a good friend of mine and it's an exceptional book. So I love it. It's an exceptional book. I love that. It's all about the boring work. You know, it's like the daily, like small little habits that you do that just over time add up to like crazy stuff. You know, one habit I've always done since I was probably 18 is a to-do list every night before I go to bed. It's boring. And I literally do it Sunday night through Thursday night. Sometimes I can do it on the weekend. It's really weird. Like, <laughs> or like I'm running errands Saturday. I'm writing out to-do list of my errands Saturday. I'm a weirdo. But just little things like that, it might seem boring, but like, you know, when I go to bed at night, like I'm just kind of thinking about what I have to do. So I wake up in the morning, I already kind of know what I have to do during the day rather than like waking up things like, okay, what am I going to do today? So it's a boring habit, but it's a habit that, you know, it's an example of what you're talking about. Kale, okay, thanks for being on. Uh, everybody, make sure you follow Kale. Uh, get that book that he talked about. Uh, if you're a salesperson, you're wanting more advanced skills, first place you want to start following us, if you're not already there, is one of our free Facebook groups at salesrevolution.pro. Salesrevolution.pro. Kale, it's an honor. Tell Alex we said hi. Thanks, Jeremy. Hey guys, if you enjoyed these, here's another you can watch right over here, right over here. Join our free Sales Revolution group. Click the link below, join us, and we're going to help you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you real soon.